I want to begin by telling you a story. It takes place in World War II. A group of soldiers, too young to have experienced and seen the things that they were witnessing, were fighting together in that conflict. And um, as often happens, when you go through horrors like that, you become close. I guess the word brother is right, brother in arms, but sometimes that doesn't even convey the closeness, the camaraderie. And these young men had become close, close like brothers, or maybe even closer than a brother. And, And at one point during some of the heaviest fighting, one of them was killed. They were just outside of a small town in France, and at the time there was no way to properly return their buddy to the United States for a burial. And so they go into this town. And there's one church, one Catholic parish, one priest, one cemetery. And they go uh, to the priest. They find the priest at his home, the, the parsonage, the manse that he lived in. And, uh, and they find him and, and, and they want to have their buddy buried properly. And the priest says, I'm sorry, there are rules. Was your friend Catholic? And he said, the guy said, well, we don't know that he was anything. And uh, he said, I, I'm sorry, you just you cannot bury him here. This is, these are the rules. This is, this is consecrated ground for those that are Catholic. And, and unfortunately, no, there are no more cemeteries close by. The young men were distraught, as you can imagine, trying to figure out what they're going to do. They're in a horrible situation, and the priest sees the the angst, the turmoil on their faces, and so he says, I'll tell you what I will do. I will provide a good burial, dignity, honor to this young man. He says, well, I can't bring him into this consecrated ground. What I can do is bury him very close to the fence. And uh, the young men really had no choice, no options. So they left their friend in the care of this priest, and they left. Years go by, and uh, the reunions, as so often happens, come and go. And one, one of those reunions, all of these young men were together. And they start recollecting, they start remembering how difficult that moment was, leaving their buddy and trusting this priest. And they decided then and there they were going to go back to France to this little town and they were going to pay their respects to the young man that they had lost so many years earlier. Uh, So they flew and they met and they go to this town and they drive to the cemetery and they begin to walk the perimeter of the fence. You can't find them. They walk all around. There's no marker. There's no graves. They're frustrated. They're angry. And so they go into town and they find the priest. He's still alive. After all these years, uh, the the old priest was now a much older priest. But as soon as they knocked on the door and the priest opened the door, he recognized these young men now now considerably older. And they, they kind of came at him with an indictment, a charge. You know, we left you to take care of our friend. There's no marker. There's no grave. We trusted you. The priest said, come with me for a moment. They walked into town and found the cemetery, and he begins to take them in the front gate. He says, you see, what happened was I paid your friend. I, I, I paid him the honor and the due that was, uh, that was due him. I, I gave him the respect and a, and a good burial. We did it with dignity. We did it with honor. We, we honored him. And he said, but God kept working on me. He said, night after night, I'd wake up and I'd hear God's voice. He said, I had done the wrong thing. And he said, one morning, one morning I got up and he said, and God had spoken so very clearly in my life, but there was this grave. I had already done it. And he said, so I went to the cemetery and I moved the fence. (laughs) It's the title of the sermon. Moving fences. You see, sometimes it's not about changing who we are. 
It's not about changing what we believe. It's not about changing the identity of the things that, that make us who we are, but sometimes it's time for us to push out the fences just a little bit and make what is a family a bigger family. Oh, this is one of those messages that should make you nervous. It makes me nervous. Because we always ask the question, well, how far? And what are you talking about, Pastor? What are we introducing? Uh, we see what's going on in the news. We see what's happening in the church. And where are you going with this, Pastor? Well, where I'm going with it is to Acts chapter 15. <laughs> We're going to go right to the Bible. We don't, we don't add to and we don't take away from. We're going to go right to Scripture. Now, as you turn to Acts chapter 15, here's, not what I, here's what I'm not going to do today. I'm not going to read it because it's tedious. It's long, and, and it's one of those passages that when you read, you don't really find a verse and pull it out. You see, this is the trick with preaching through some of the passages in Acts. It really doesn't lend itself to a thought. You know, when you preach uh, Paul's letters or you preach out of the Gospels, oftentimes there is a parable and there's a point or there's a passage and you can, uh, you can make all these points and you can outline it, but you come to some of these stories in the book of Acts and you're not dealing so much with passages as you are principles. Today we come to this passage and it's a passage of principles. So let me explain to you what has happened as we get into this story. You see, the church, the church has grown exponentially. Oh, you know the story. We've sung about it all day. One of, my, one of my favorite songs, In Christ Alone. Oh, my goodness. It tells the whole story. Um, talking about his birth, that the fullness of God was dwelt in this baby. And then this baby grew with Scripture says in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and in man. And uh, became the Messiah that we recognize. Died on the cross for our sins. There in the ground his body laid. But bursting forth. In glorious, in glorious rays, up from the grave, he rose again. This is the story we tell. Jesus was dead. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose again. The disciples saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. This was real. It wasn't some spiritual event. It was a physical resurrection. This was part of their identity. And as soon as that happened, they began proclaiming the reality of Jesus Christ himself. It is what we call good news. That's what the word gospel means. It was good news. Death is no longer in charge. Sin no longer needs to have, uh, have absolute sway, whether in our lives or in the world around us. This is good news. And they began proclaiming this good news. And, and, and Jesus was there for 40 days and ascended. ascended. He didn't fly off to some distant reality. He ascended to a throne, a position, a place of power from where he is, he is overseeing. He is running the universe. Isn't that amazing? We're familiar with the concept of God running the universe, but he's not just God. He's the God-man. And in a sense, humanity, the perfect man, is running the universe. Isn't that great? And so there he is, he's, he's ordering, he's overseeing, he's orchestrating, he's interceding for us to the Father. The enfleshed God, the incarnated Christ, is seated in the heavenly. But he's not here. We recognize that. So the Holy Spirit comes. God the Father sends his Spirit. Jesus promised that his Spirit would come. And the church receives that Spirit on an amazing day. Fifty days after, after uh, the, the Passover, uh, the, the Spirit of God descends upon the church. Tongues of fire and, and, and descending upon the disciples. The sound of a mighty rushing wind. And they're filled with the Spirit and the birth of the church on that day, Pentecost. And from that day, it says 3,000 were added to their number on that day. That's a church growth model, if ever there was one. Imagine that. You're, we're like, what do we need to grow the church? Turns out all you need is the Holy Spirit. Huh. We should try that. 
You know, and, and, and the church grew, and 3,000 were added to their number that day, and it was an amazing moment. They, uh, there were the tongues of fire became, a, in a sense, a burning passion in their lives so that when they spoke, they spoke with the fire of the Spirit. And even people, whether they were speaking in a different language or hearing it in a different language, it doesn't matter. God was there, and, and the gospel was going out to all people, but something was still missing in the midst of this. You see, while everyone was hearing this story, it was still a distinctly distinctly Jewish story. They were in Jerusalem. Oh, and there were people from all over. Uh, We read that when we go to Acts chapter 2. They were there, and they, they were there, and they celebrated, and they saw what was going on. They were participating. They went home. But at this point, Christianity was still Jewish. It was a Jewish Messiah that they were worshiping. It was in Israel and and in Jerusalem, the Jewish capital. The disciples were all Jewish. Everybody, uh, regardless of what the Renaissance painters would have you believe, everybody in the stories that we're familiar with are Jewish. Like Jesus did not look like a Swedish dude from an 80s hairband. That wasn't Jesus. He was dark-skinned. He was Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. He he was a Jewish Messiah. They were in Jerusalem. They were in Israel, the church's birth, and and they didn't instantly become Christians. It wasn't like uh, it wasn't like an us and them. There was there was the Jews, and on the day of Pentecost, then all of a sudden there were Christians. And now we have two very different things. That's not how it worked. They were still Jews. They were a sect within Judaism. So when Paul starts persecuting the church, uh, we've talked about this. What he was doing was he was, he was dealing with, with, with what he thought was an in-house problem, <laughs> church discipline. Aren't you glad we don't do church discipline the way Saul did? Right? He, that's what he thought. He thought, it was, he thought it was church discipline. And so they were persecuting the Christians, but they weren't persecuting them as Christians. They were persecuting them as Jewish participants who had kind of, they thought, gone off the deep end. So this is going on. Jewish Messiah, Jewish, uh, Jewish church in, a, in the Jewish capital. Do you get this was very Jewish? Okay, something happens. Along the way, God's Spirit indwells His disciples, and they begin to proclaim this good news boldly. One of those those proclaimers was a man by the name of Stephen. You can read his story in Acts chapter 5, 6, and 7. And uh, and Stephen, filled with the Spirit, um, starts, uh, starts proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. They didn't want to hear that. He's brought before a Sanhedrin, and he says, he says, this same Jesus whom you crucified. Now, we, go, we, we hear that, and we go, you know, just like we, I crucified Jesus. My sin put Jesus on the cross. No, Stephen was talking to the people who actually crucified Jesus. It's pretty remarkable. Talk about guts. Talk about courage. The same Jesus whom you crucified. You killed all the prophets. They talked about Jesus. And guess what you did to Jesus? You did the same thing to him that you did to all the prophets. And he he says at the end of Acts chapter 6, he looks at all of these people and he says, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts. Oh, remember that phrase. It's going to be important. They didn't take kindly to that. They drug him outside of town, and they stoned him to death. Stephen was the first, (laughs) we're talking about martyrs, Stephen was the first one to die with the name of Jesus Christ on his lips. And he died with the prayer of Jesus coming out of his mouth. Father, do not hold this sin against them. Same prayer Jesus prayed. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he dies. Here's what's interesting. It says on that day, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. On that day, great persecution broke out in the church. And the church was scattered. It says, except for the apostles who stayed in Jerusalem. So now the Christians are running. Remember, this is a a, a Jewish sect 
in Jerusalem, in Israel, celebrating the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ongoing life of a Jewish Messiah. But now these Jews are being persecuted and great persecution, and, and they scatter like shrapnel on, in the middle of an explosion. They scatter all over the world, all over the Gentile world. Uh, Peter would talk about this later in his letter. He introduced his letter by, uh, by speaking to God's elect. Now, that was a term reserved for Jews, to God's elect who are strangers in the world. Understand, when Scripture talks about strangers and aliens, they're not talking about this idea that we're just here for a little while, like this is boot camp for eternity, and then we're out of here. He's talking about the way that we live our lives. He, he's talking about the way that these Jewish Christians were now strangers and aliens in a Gentile world. They belong there. They just didn't quite fit there. And so even Peter, Peter, the, the super apostle, Peter says to God's elect strangers in the world, get this, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. He never even mentioned Israel. He's talking to the Jewish Christians who have now scattered. Guess what happened when these Jewish Christians scattered? They started proclaiming that same name wherever they went, the name of Jesus, and, and amazing things, they were persecuted, they endured suffering, they, they were ostracized, horrible things happened to these early Christians. And the Gentile world, the world within, within Israel and also outside of the Israel saw what these Christians were enduring and saw the joy with which they endured it. Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you endure conflict and suffering of any kind. And they saw this. They heard the good news of Jesus Christ. They saw the suffering of these Jewish Christians. And they said, there is something there. And something profound began to happen. All of a sudden, these Jewish Christians started inviting Gentile worshipers to accept the same Jesus, to be filled with the same spirit. And what's amazing is that very quickly, what was a Jewish thing became a Gentile thing. So now there's a problem. There's a problem that has arisen in the church, and it's, it's kind of an internal problem. Now we have these Jewish Christians, and we have these Gentile Christians, and there's a whole bunch more of the Gentile Christians than there are of the Jewish Christians. But, but the, the uber-Jewish Christians, the, uh, the apostles, are all in Jerusalem. And they've never really moved beyond that point. And so they're kind of living and working in this very Jewish culture. So at some point, they've lost touch with this. Well, Paul goes off on a missionary journey. Even Peter goes off on a missionary journey. And, 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 and they start hearing these reports about all these Gentiles coming into the fold. So some people went up from Jerusalem. They're like, well, if these Gentiles are getting saved, we've got to make sure that they're doing it the right way. It's always great when we send people out to tell others how the right way is to get saved. This is what they did. And they said they came with the authority of James. James was the brother of Jesus, and at this point had kind of assumed a role of authority in the church. And they said, we've come with the authority of James, which is in a sense saying, we've come with the authority of the Jerusalem church, you know, the real Christians. <laughs> and here's what they all say. <laughs> you got to get circumcised. <laughs> Picture their faces. Okay, let's change the context a bit. Let's move forward 2,000 years. Let's do a, uh, a 21st century or 20th century altar call, right? Let's pretend now we've got a, um, a first century world doing a 20th century altar call, uh, the, the way that we do altar calls. Now, the altar, the way that we do the altar is a great thing, but the tradition of the altar is about 150 years old. Okay, so they didn't do the altar the way that we do the altar, and that's, that's fine. We, we've got an amazing thing. Um, but but, but let's, have, let's pretend there's an altar call. Gentile comes and gets saved. And uh, teary-eyed, we gather around. We've got people praying for him, and 
he's going to pray through. And we get it to happen. And whoo, there's rejoicing. And, and there he is. And everybody's happy. And, and, and the, the, the young person that's just, that, that's just uh, prayed through and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior looks up from the altar with all these people encouraging him, wipes the tears away from his eyes and says, so now what? And, and we always give him good advice. Oh, you need to read your Bible. Absolutely. Read your Bible. That's one of the first things you do. And you got to pray. Oh, yeah, dialogue with God. And you got to get circumcised. <laughs> what? What? Where did, that, where did that come in? Now, understand, this was a Jewish church. And for 2,000 years, from the time of Abraham up to that point, this was the mark of the covenant of God upon their life. 2,000 years of history. They had all of the Bible telling them that this is what they should do. And now all these Gentiles are coming in. They're proclaiming the name of Christ, but they're ignoring this very first statute of what it means to be Jews. This was a Jewish Messiah in the Jewish capital with Jewish leaders. So a question arose. <laughs> Do you need to become Jewish to become Christian? Do you need to get circumcised to accept Christ? This was a church controversy. Aren't you glad we don't have that kind of a church controversy? Wouldn't you hate to be an usher in that church? <laughs> like, like what, how do you do the seating there? Um, and, and who's checking? You know, it'd be horrible, <laughs> horrible job. Um, this, is, this is the context, right? This, this is something dramatic has just happened, and all of these Gentiles are coming in, and the Jews are just, at this point, they're kind of, kind of freaking out. So there's a council that is convened. We call it the first ecumenical council. There would be like six others that would follow over the course of, uh, of several hundred years. Um, but this was the first. The church convenes. Um, they bring Paul back in from his journey. And Paul and Barnabas, even Peter, is there. And they start testifying uh, to what, what they have seen in this world outside of this Jewish circle. And they're saying it's real. What God is doing is real, and they testify to this before the assembly, um, and, and, and they're, they're telling the stories of, of what God is doing and the transformation and the lives that are being changed, and they're telling this story, and, and this discussion arises over this very issue. Now, we listen to it now, and we go, well, what's the big deal? Whose business is it? Why? Why is this in the Bible? Why does it take up such a big portion, a whole chapter? Well, we're 2,000 years removed from it. As much history as the Jews had, we now have the same amount of history on the other side of it. And guess what? Where the Jews were on the inside saying, who comes in through the fence? Now we're on the inside. And we're the ones who have constructed the fences. Is it the same issue? No. But we have done a good job of constructing new ones. What must I do to be saved? Well, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's what you must do to be saved. This idea of repentance, this idea of new life, death, burial, resurrection that we talk about in baptism. Uh, that's what you must do to be saved. Repent and, and turn to Jesus. But so often they ask the question, what must we do to be saved? And we say, well, the first thing you need to do is quit doing that nonsense and, and get rid of this and clean up that and, and, and start this and do that and then you can be saved. It's not right. It's the fences we've put in place. Today we're going to push out some of the fences. We're going to move some of the fences. Yeah, it's, it's, it's important for us, though, as we get into us, to this, to acknowledge the fact that this is difficult for us. This is difficult. We have traditions. We have things that we've always done, things that we've always known, things that we've always understood. We have, oh, we have the church behind us on some of our practices. In fact, there are many instances when we can even quote Scripture just like the Jews. This is difficult. 
This is a difficult conversation. Do you realize, though, that for 2,000 years, the church has functioned as a primarily Gentile construct? And so now we come at it from a bit of a different vantage. The beauty of moving fences, I said this before, is that we do not need to change the message we have received or even the identity that belongs to us within Christianity in order to bring others into the fold. We can get rid of the obstacles without changing the identity of who we are. It's still hard. And so I will quote the eminent Dr. Wright on this point, that at some point we need to learn to be able to tell the difference between the differences of the things that make a difference and the differences of the things that don't make a difference. Should I say that again? We need to be able, we need to learn to be able to tell the difference between the differences that make a difference and the differences that don't make a difference. There are some differences that just don't matter. And there are some differences that absolutely do matter. You notice, uh, moving fences is not about removing fences. There are some boundaries we do not cross. It's very trepidatious this morning, isn't it? It's a tightrope sometimes. And I think sometimes we need to walk the razor's edge because if we never walk the razor's edge, we're never grappling with the messiness of life. I see scripture so often like a tug of war. If you can picture it in your mind, there's two equally matched teams. There's, uh, sometimes they put a flag in the middle or a big knot in the rope. And there's, there's two lines and the team that gets the flag on one side or the other wins. Now, if you have two equally matched teams, it stays exactly centered. And I think sometimes scripture works that way. It tugs us to one side, tugs us to another side, and you're like, but that's tension. And sometimes there's supposed to be tension because that's what keeps us on the straight and narrow. It's that tension that pulls us. So we're going to walk that tension this morning. I hope you feel it this morning. And the reason I hope you feel it this morning is because I have felt it all week long and misery loves company. And so we're going to walk this tightrope together. We have grown so afraid. I'm going to read this slowly and and carefully. We have grown so afraid of losing the things that make us distinct that we have ceased to live distinctive lives. Instead, we hide our distinctiveness behind high walls and long fences to keep anyone from threatening our Christian boundaries. It is my personal experience that the greater the size of the fence, the greater the fear of those who reside on the inside. We must build them higher and longer so that there are fewer threatening the things that I hold sacred within. But there is a better solution to the life of the Christian I remember it was said best by um, a pastor, Scott Daniels, at a conference I went to some years ago. Here's what he says. There is a story that is told about a Californian rancher and a farmer who won a grant to study agrarian practices in, in the place of his choosing. And he decided to go to Australia and learn from the ranchers and the farmers there. At the end of his weeks of observation and learning, his Australian mentors asked him what were his most surprising insights and the greatest differences between American and Australian practices. The Californian noted many differences, but the one that surprised him most was the general lack of fences built by those raising the sheep. He says, where I come from, We construct many high-tech fences to keep the sheep out of the crops and away from the predators. Here I notice that there might be a small rock wall built near a cliff or another small boundary placed near the woods, but for the most part, the sheep are raised without being fenced in. The Australian responded, that is a keen observation. Of course, I'm hearing Crocodile Dundee doing this. Um, That is a keen observation. He says, some decades ago, many generations ago, our sheep herders discovered that if they would dig the wells with very, if they would dig the wells deep with very good water, the sheep would not wander very far from the wells. It made the fences unnecessary. So here it is: the deeper the well, the less the sheep wander. <laughs> we dig deep. 
we dig deep. How do you keep the sheep from wandering? Well, we can pen them in, and that's what we've done. Or we can dig the well deep. We can give good water, clean water, fresh water. And I feel like this is where we are as a church. We need to dig deep. If we are afraid of losing ourselves by moving the fences, then it is because we have not dug the wells deep enough. This is a dangerous call of the Christian community to dig wells deep and to move fences. It is dangerous. This is our vocation, and it is a scandal. I made up this word. This is a scandal to churchiness. (laughs) It's a scandal because we like our boundaries. Digging wells deep and moving fences is hard grace, scandalous grace. So let's talk for a moment about digging wells and moving high fences. We do this in two ways. Let me give you the first. First of all, we commit to God's truth rather than personal preference. We commit to God's truth, not what I think, not what I believe, but what God has told us. This is what we read in Acts 15. After there had been much debate, get this, in church, we always say, well, if only we could get back to the days of the the early church, they were just as messed up as we are. Because even then, the church was full of people. I don't know if you know this, but there is a principle. In churches, there are 10 different people. They just have different names, whichever church you go to. But it's the same 10 people, right? Um, And so when we moved here, um, when we moved here, we'd meet some of you folks and we would go home and we talked about you. We we absolutely talked about you. And if you think it's only a past thing, it's not. We still talk about you. We go home and Dana and I will be talking and we do it without the kids, right? We don't have roast layman for for dinner, Um, but... uh, um, but we, we talk about you, and, and when we first moved here, we'd meet you, and, and, and you know, in your head, you build profiles for everyone, and we go, oh, well, they're a such and such, and we'd list a name off from someone else we knew. Oh, they're, they're a, a this guy, and, they're, and we, we would go through that. It's the same 10 people, and, and, and this is the way it's worked from the first day of the days of the church. Same 10 people. I, and just for the sake of grace, we'll say, uh, because there were 12 uh, apostles, we'll say it's the same 12 people. Um, uh, but after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart, get this, God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. You see, we commit to God's truth rather than personal preference. And what this tells us, what this passage tells us, is that God testifies to the work of God in in the lives of the people around us. Did you know it's not my job and it's not your job to be the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit has that job. We're not the litmus for another person's faith. We're not the standard for another person's walk. God testifies to that. God bears witness. God gives them their Holy Spirit and God cleanses their hearts, not you and me. That's a wall, that's a, uh, that's a fence that we've put in where our standard is imposed upon them. My personal convictions become a thing that, uh, that becomes necessary for your salvation. And that's wrong, church, it's wrong. And here's the reality of this. If, if, if this does not seem to be present in the life of someone around us, that means one of two things. The first thing that means is that God has not done a work in their life. If you look at them and you say, well, they don't, uh, God's not bearing witness. Well, then that means God has not done a work in their life. Or if you look in their, at their life and you don't see the fruit, maybe it's because God hasn't done a work in your life. <laughs> so it's one of two things, but it's God's job to bear witness, not yours. And so either God has done the work in them and you're wrong, or God has, has not done a work in them and they need Jesus. Those are the only two options. So we commit to God's truth 
rather than personal preference. I wish we could spend more time here, but we spend so much time in our Christian life condemning the world around us based on our personal convictions. Some of you read my resume when we moved here. It was strategic, some of the things I put in there. I didn't want a job if you didn't understand who I was. <laughs> you didn't want me to come if you didn't under. There are things, and some of these things, like, you're like, man, Pastor, I, I wish you would let us know. <laughs> we would have, we would have, uh, <laughs> we would have reconsidered. Like, like you, you hid that really well. Uh, uh, Dana reminds me of some things. She's like, you were not, were not like this when we dated. And I said, you wouldn't have married me otherwise. Um, <laughs> But there are some things I put in, in my resume just to let you know. I, I made the comment that sometimes I go to dances with my daughters. Okay, you need to know that. Why? Well, because we've had statements in the Church of the Nazarene that have prohibited that action. And if you didn't want me going to dance with, dances with my daughters, then you needed to know that up front. I put that in there. I put that sometimes I take my wife to a theater, movie theater. You know why I put that in there? Because we have a history sometimes of, of, of our personal convictions being, being part of the culture necessary for salvation. Now, are convictions good? Yes. Should we maintain our convictions, our personal convictions? Absolutely but we do not impose personal convictions. We do not add to or take away from Scripture. Jesus is enough or not enough at all. Here's the thing you need to know. Jesus plus anything ruins everything. And we do that. Now, I have personal convictions. I do. I'm a man of conviction but my convictions are not necessary for your salvation. And we've got to understand this. So we commit to God's truth rather than personal preference. How about this? We require of ourselves that which we require of others. Oh, man, that stinks. Um, Acts 15.10, Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the, of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? We couldn't even do it, and now you want to impose it on others. Wow. He's, he's talking, of course, about circumcision, um, but there is a broader implication. He's talking about the Mosaic law as a whole. He says, we, we couldn't do it. Our fathers couldn't do it. We can do it. Even the people in this assembly, none of you have done it. Yet you're wanting to impose this thing upon others that you've not managed to accomplish yourself. Here's the thing. Did you know you will be judged by the standard of which you judge others? That's what this is about. How you judge others is how you will be judged because with your own words, you condemn yourself. You're imposing something on others that you yourself are not, uh, are not living up to. And God will judge you for those things, those very things that you're saying others need to do that you're not doing. God is, is going to judge you on the standards that you set for others. Ah, wow. Wow. Um, it's like this. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 14, it's like the blind leading the blind. Um, I, for Christmas, I, I, I bought myself a book and told Dana to give it to me. Um, and uh, it, it, it's so much easier. She bought herself a piece of jewelry and I gave it to her. So it worked out perfect. And, uh, and we did it on Amazon. And so neither of us even had to get out of our chairs. It was, it was amazing. It's, that's how Christmas should be. Um, but, uh, but one of these books is by a photographer um, for a, a popular fashion magazine. And he, he found Jesus. Jesus came into his life, and it changed everything. And he started, he, he did this photo shoot called Journeys with uh, the Messiah. And, and I wanted this book because the pictures are captivating. But Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. This is a photograph by Michael Belk. I, I think this is good. Let them... Jesus said, that's the Pharisees. Leave them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. This is what's happening. We, we impose standards that we ourselves are not keeping. 
we, we require things that we ourselves can't keep. This is what God has to say about this. He, he says that this is leading to our destruction. Here's the thing. It is my personal experience that we cannot lead people where we ourselves have never gone. And we can only lead them as far as we have journeyed. Do you know the burden of that that I carry for you in that regard? I can't lead you down a path that I've not walked. This is why it says that pastors and teachers, those in authorities will be judged more harshly because I can't stand here and tell you what you should and shouldn't do if I myself am not doing that and living up to it. I'll be judged by harsher standards because of that. I cannot lead you any further than I myself have gone, and this is the way it works in the church. Even good things become wicked things in the mouths and the lives of the unredeemed righteous. (laughs) Let me read that phenomenal sentence again. Even good things become wicked things in the mouths and in the lives of the unredeemed righteous. We might call them the holier than thou. Consider the implications of our lives when we recite the teachings of Jesus. Things like love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, blessed are the peacemakers and the merciful and the meek. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, Imagine uh, the implications of our lives when we recite these teachings of Jesus and then vomit back to the world the same hate-filled rhetoric of world retribution, revenge and violence and hatred. Imagine the implications of that. We are emasculating the gospel when we do that because we are holding the world to a standard that we ourselves will not keep. We must require of ourselves that which we require of us, uh, of others. Be very careful that the standards by which you judge others are the standards by which you judge yourself. Personal convictions are good, but personal convictions must be tempered by love. This becomes the standard of our judgment. Personal convictions must be tempered by love. And and we've done damage to this word love, haven't we, in our culture? So let me help you unpack this for just a minute. I want you to see this in two parts. Um, Conviction without love is terrorism. Paul, Saul, right? He had great conviction, not much love. Look at what he was doing to the church. It was terrorism. They're like, man, Saul was horrible. Yeah, yeah, he should come to church with us sometime. He should read Facebook sometime. Lots of conviction, zero love. And it's terrorism. You're like, well, that's too strong of a word. Well, let's make it better. Christian terrorism. I mean, that's what it is. It's conviction without love. But here's the other side of the coin. The, The word that love itself has done damage. So love without conviction is tolerance. Hmm. Doesn't that make you throw up in your mouth a little bit? Tolerance, what a, what a word. Hey, can I tell you, tolerance and terrorism are the same thing. Tolerance is another form of terrorism because what you're saying is, I have all this love. I'm just not going to tell you that you're going to end up in hell. <laughs> I'm going to tolerate your sin and never tell you that, that, that the road is out in front of you. I'm going to let you hurdle along. The bridge is gone. I'm going to let you keep hurdling that direction. I'm not going to tell you because I love you and I don't want to upset you. That's tolerance. It's terrorism because they're going to, they're going to end up the same way, dead. Um, so tolerance is, is love without conviction. Does that help clarify? This is how, this is how the church is supposed to work. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the things that, that we do to kind of push the fences out. We're moving out the fences. But what of the fences themselves? Pastor, are there no boundaries at all? Well, that's not right either. Um, I, I am not suggesting that there are no boundaries. Of course, there are boundaries. There are always points where we must draw the line in the sand and say here and no further. Even this council unanimously agreed that there were certain aspects of the Christian faith that were necessary to the community. So moving fences does not mean removing 
fences. There are still some boundaries that must never be crossed, markers that set us apart from the world in which we live. And he tells them what they are. You can see it down in verse 20. I'll begin reading with verse 19. James is presiding. And he has, he has heard the testimony of Paul and Barnabas. He's heard the testimony of Peter. And uh, the broader story is that Peter is the hero in this story. Peter needs to be a hero in the story once in a while. Because every time he opens his mouth, it's just to change feet. And, uh, and so occasionally, occasionally he needs to be the hero. Here's what's amazing is that, that if you read the story in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that he confronted Peter publicly about some hypocrisy in his life, dealing with eating with Jews and eating with Gentiles. So Paul calls out Peter publicly, but now Peter comes and is standing publicly alongside Paul after that. Isn't that amazing? Um, the only one missing in this ensemble is Mary. <laughs> so uh, so, so here, here's what James says after hearing all of this. He says in verse 19, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God. Well, the trouble he's talking about is in particular circumcision. He says, It's my judgment we should not trouble those Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them, to abstain from things polluted to idols. So there are boundaries from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Now, aren't those some odd boundaries? Let's talk about them quickly. Um, I want to categorize them in, in broad scope. The first thing that we see is, uh, is, is this idea of, well, the first thing we see is this idea of moving the fences, of course, but we're also keeping the fences. We're moving them out, but we're keeping them. Um, uh, but but here's, here's the first thing he says is do not engage in idolatry. Guess what? That's the first commandment. This isn't the first time God has said this. Um, I, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, Exodus chapter 20. You shall have no other gods before me. That's idolatry, having other gods before, before Yahweh, God. It's idolatry. And, and you're like, whoo. Glad I don't have a grotto with a glowing idol in there. But we do shape our entire lives in these shrines around a glowing box. Where, 80, 000, where we watch 80,000 people gather to pay homage to our gladiators. Huh. Idolatry. Are these things bad things in and of themselves? No. But look at what we do with it. Look at the idols in our life. Whatever is the biggest thing in your life is the biggest thing in your life. It's an idol. Maybe it's your kids' schedule. It's an idol. Getting them to the next thing, right? Maybe it's wealth. Maybe it's your lack of money. Did you know a lack of money can be your idol? Because if that's what you obsess about, that's more important to you than God. Um, these idols in our life, maybe it's busyness. Whoo, that's mine. I have to crucify that idol constantly. And we do that in our culture. It's this idea in our culture that, that you must be important if you're busy. You must be accomplishing something if you're busy. Huh. It's an idol. Um, we, we have so many idols. At least, at least a couple thousand years ago, you could tell an idol from... <laughs> from the rest of life. You know, it looked like something. Now our idols are just part of our life. And we worship at the feet of them. Get rid of idols. That's what he says. He says, no idolatry. Nothing before God. That's an immovable fence. You're like, well, but, but pastor, my health is so bad. You know, your good health can be an idol. Your bad health can be an idol. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm too young to do anything. Well, well, grow up and get over it. Well, I'm too old to accomplish anything. Well, Paul started and did his best work late in life, so that's a, that's a poor excuse. Well, I don't have enough hair. Um, well, that, that's just wear ball cap, whatever it is, right? I mean, we make all these stupid little things idols. We take dumb things and we make them God things and we fall at our, their feet and we worship them. All of the time. No idols. That's an immovable fence. 
How about this one? It seems to not matter whether you are in 1 AD or 21 AD or 2000 BC. This seems to have been an issue. Abstain from sexual immorality. Period. Well, what, what, is, what does that entail? Well, here's an immovable fence. God says sex outside of marriage is wrong. Sex outside of marriage with one man and one woman is wrong. It's wrong. God says, uh, God says um, sex in your mind is wrong. Pornography, wrong. It's immorality. Now, I want to say something that's going to make my email blow up this week. Okay? So hang on. Hang on. But listen to me all the way through. Agree? Pinky promise? Okay. Listen to me all the way through. Identifying as a homosexual is not a sin. Practicing homosexual sex is. There is a distinct difference. Okay. We would say, well, I, I, Pastor, our, uh, you know, uh, uh, you're a guy. You ever tempted to look the other way from your wife? Yes. Is that a sin, the temptation? No, the practice is. You see, there is a distinct difference. And we've got to recognize this difference. It is not our job, it is not our job to say who God loves and who God does not love. What it is our job to do is to maintain the, the purity of what God has, has called holy. One man, one woman, one life. It's sin otherwise not the temptation, the practice. Boy, wasn't that fun. <laughs> so this was an issue. This is an immovable barrier. Um, uh, do not engage in idolatry. Abstain, abstain from sexual immorality. And finally, give up your freedoms for the things that hinder the community. This meat strangled in the blood and all of that, it was about table fellowship. It was about eating together. You see, um, circumcision wasn't going to prevent the meal. But someone might not come to the table if there was blood in the meat. If, if the practices did not, it did not meet some kosher practices. I mean, uh, some of the Jews were saying, well, we're already eating pork. What's next? <laughs> right? Now it's bloody pork. Ugh. You know, that's horrible. And, and, and what they're saying is, it's not about the blood in the meat or the blood on the plate. What it is about are, are giving up those things that you are free to do for the sake of the people around you, for the sake of community. And here's the thing, is mature Christians give up their freedoms for the sake of immature Christians. We've got this idea in our head that maturity means I get to do whatever I want to do. Right? You thought that as a kid. Like, I can't wait to grow up because then I can do what I want to do. And then you grew up and you found, okay, yeah, I can actually, I can at any time of the day or night get in my car and just go and do whatever. The law allows me to do that. I can run off with another woman. I can go to uh, the, the store. I can, I, I can go and squander all my money on booze. I can do these things. I'm allowed. But because I'm taking care of people around me, I give up my rights. That's what the mature do. The mature doesn't mean you have more rights insofar as you get to express greater freedom. Maturity actually means you have more rights to give up your freedom. But we've got it turned around. We've got our convictions turned around where the mature Christians are the ones being offended. Isn't that amazing? The offended are the ones who have been walking with Christ and here come the babies and, oh, can you believe these new Christians, what they're doing the things that they're bringing into the house of the Lord, uh, the, uh, the, the raucousness of, uh, of whatever it is. Is it the music? I had a great moment the other night when my kids came out of their room and said, Dad, turn down the music. <laughs> it was such a good moment. I was playing U2 and it was loud. And they're like, Dad, Turn down the music. And it was a great moment in my life. But, but, but this is what we've done is we have, we have reversed the offense where the mature are the ones becoming offended and the immature are the ones being pushed out. Maturity actually means that 
You refuse to be offended. Maturity actually means you give up some of your rights for the sake of the immature. You know why I'm raising kids? So that they become functioning enough to get out of my house. The point. Right? That's the whole point. You make them functional so that they can leave. But we've done this backwards in the church. Exactly opposite. We've made them more dependent. More and more and more dependent. And we cater more and more and more in consumerism and capitalism in the church. And now we've got a church that caters to the whims rather than a church that caters to the gospel. Living in right relationship with others is part of living in right relationship with God. The way that God did this was by sacrificially giving up his rights as God so that we could come to him as brother. In the same way, we sacrificially give up our rights so that we can exist together as brother and sister. This is moving fences. I think there's a reason. I think there's a reason why there's a small crowd this morning. This was not a message for everyone. And I look around the room. This was a message for the church. This was a message for God's elect. This was a message for you. Here's the thing. We're going to leave this place and we're going to push some fences. We're going to push it out. We're not removing them. We're not changing who we are. But we're pushing out the fences a little bit. (laughs) We're going to make it so that people want to come in. We're going to dig the well deep. We're We're going to offer fresh clean, pure water, and it's going to be the the most remarkable thing that people have ever seen or experienced, and they're going to want to come. That's what we're going to do. We're not going to build more fences and higher fences. We're going to push them a little bit. So to that end, I'm pushing you a little bit. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray for you, and then you're going to leave. (laughs) But as we leave, we're pushing out those fences. You're leaving into a world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Will you stand with me?